All right, we are going to continue uh, with our series. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. Uh, I get a lot of this material from John Ortbrook's book by that title. And uh, it is my plan that this is the last Sunday in that series. This is week six. Uh, and so I, I hope you've uh, been learning something uh, from this verse. But we're going to start by reading the scripture passage upon which it is based. I got up this morning and was checking my Facebook real quick, and one of my pastor friends, uh, who is actually kind of semi-retired, is filling in today uh, in, a, in a Michigan church, and uh, he posted that he was filling in and preaching today on his favorite Bible story, the story of Jeter, G Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water. Uh, so I'm not the only one covering this material today. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 14, beginning with the 22nd verse. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. When Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus, but then he saw the wind. He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they had climbed into the boat, the wind had died down. Uh, then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. A little bit of uh, American history. Uh, this is a map. You can tell it's the United States, or the western two-thirds of it anyway. Uh, the line there represents the expedition of Lewis and Clark. Most of us have heard of Lewis and Clark and are aware that they took this expedition. Uh, the idea was is they were to scout um, the rest of the country to the Pacific. And, uh, you know, we look at this map and see the route they took. But what we have to remember is when they took this route, they were creating this route. Uh, they were creating this map to some extent. Uh, they didn't have a map of where things went from here. Uh, they, had, uh, they became, by the time they got halfway around, they became some of the first non-Native Americans to ever see these lands. And they had some misperceptions about, what, uh, about how these lands worked. And so after traveling for two years, you know, they're on foot with a small group of people, uh, they arrive at a place where they really believed that uh, we, we've reached almost the end. Uh, there was a high bluff on the river. Uh, and you can see here's a map of showing where they were when this happened. Uh, it was at the headwaters of the Missouri River. And they really believed that this high bluff here, uh, we'll climb to the top of that, we'll look over the other side, and we're going to see this beautiful river valley that just takes us to the Pacific Ocean. It's not very much farther. And Meriwether Lewis climbed to the top of that bluff and looked out, and instead of a beautiful river valley, he was the first European to see the Rocky Mountains. They had come for two years. They had lost people to death. They had come across some, some uh, not very friendly uh, Native American tribes. Uh, they had had uh, people desert them and refuse to go any farther. There had been illness that had killed people. It had been a terrible, terrible journey. And they finally get to where they think, oh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're just going to get over this bluff and everything's smooth sailing from then and it's not very much farther. And they get up there and see the Rocky Mountains. Not a good day. 
<clears throat> How do they have the strength and energy to keep going? I think the key is the word resilience. That's a word that uh, we hear sometimes, but we don't use too awfully often. Uh, we kind of know what it means from the context. Uh, I want to give you the, the official definition. It is the capacity to adapt to inevitable changes and challenges in life and achieve goals and continue to grow. So resilience is that ability or that, that capacity uh, when you think you're done and you're going to take a breather and it's time to rest and it's almost over the end of the tunnel and then you turn the corner and there's the Rocky Mountains. How do you keep going? Well, having resilience is that ability to help you keep going. Um, I'm talking about it because uh, I think this is kind of analogous to Peter in our story. Uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition is a little bit analogous. So first of all, uh, Peter got out of the boat. Remember we talked last week about what that's the first step. The great faith it took to do that. He had no reason to believe he could do it except Jesus told him to do it, so he's going to do it. Uh, so, you know, that, that's like a great, uh, great moment. And then he begins walking, and he's taking steps, and he's thinking, man, this is working. I'm actually walking on water. And, you know, to our knowledge, no other human being in the course of human history has done that except Jesus and Peter. And so people criticize Peter for what comes next. Uh, and yet, you know, Peter walked on water and you didn't. You know, uh, so that, that's a good one for Peter. Uh, it looked and felt like victory. It was exciting to Peter. And he must have just really felt good about himself. And you know, I'm doing it. Uh, this is working. Uh, what a glorious moment that must have been. Just like when Lewis and Clark thought, we've arrived at the headwaters of this river, uh, we're going to get over this bluff, and then it's uh, the river valley and smooth sailing for the rest of the way. Uh, this is just awesome. Um, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're about done. And then he saw the wind, <laughs> which was kind of like Lewis and Clark seeing the Rockies. Uh, when he saw the wind, which of course, you know, how do you see wind? Uh, well, you know, when it's blowing hard, you can tell. Uh, and, you know, he would have seen the effects of the wind. The waves would have been, would have been coming up and, uh, you know, his clothes would have been blowing and all that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so that, that moment when all of a sudden, after thinking you have victory, uh, all of a sudden there's, there's something barrier in the way. There's more hardship ahead, uh, and it's not going to be so easy to finish. The net result, of course, was uh, Peter began to sink. Uh, he, he saw the, the problems, and, and he, he kind of gave up, and he, and he let his faith kind of run away from him, and, and uh, he let it go. I think that Peter lacked the resilience that Lewis and Clark had. And so I want to talk just a little bit about resilience because there are actually steps you can take to increase your own resilience. There are actually things you can do to work on becoming more resilient. First of all, uh, to be resilient, you have to exercise control rather than passively act. So when I was thinking about this idea of, of uh, exercising control, uh, I thought of the recent hurricane that Robin's parents were involved in, and I thought, there are those, you might see them sometimes on TV, uh, being interviewed, that have a very much give-up attitude. It's like, well, a hurricane's coming, well, we're just going to ride it out, we're going to stay at home, and whatever happens, happens. We can't really do much about it. Uh, and resilient people say, well, you know, it's coming, I'm going to take action. And they board up their windows, and they... They uh, go outside, and I know for Robin's parents, they gather up the lawn chairs and patio table and get those inside, anything that was going to blow away or blow around and cause debris, and, 
and they do all of those kinds of things that need to be done. Uh, and then they say, now we're going to drive inland a couple hours and spend the night so that, you know, the power's out and this, that, and the other. Uh, we're safe. Uh, and so they, they take that action instead of just let it overwhelm them. Uh, and, and that just requires some, some mental energy. Uh, but it's the idea of like, exercising control rather than just letting things happen. Uh, so there are those, you know, it's like, well, I don't have the money to pay this bill. So I'm just going to not pay it, and you know they'll call me in a month and yell at me for not paying it, and I'll get you know repossessed or foreclosed. Uh, whereas the active person, maybe the only thing you can do is call the creditor and say, "Hey, I've got problems here. We need to work out an arrangement." Uh, but even that is like being active rather than passive uh, in the act. And by doing that, that's one way to gain resilience. To be resilient. You must remain committed to your values. Uh, the number of people um, that talk about uh, they, they get tempted and they, and they say they succumb to tempt us uh, because they were at a weak point in their lives. You ever hear that phrase? Well, I was at a weak point. And so what happens is, is uh, they're, they're, they're facing tough odds, uh, they don't know what to do, they, they, and, and then some temptation comes up that they normally would say no to. And now because they're, they're in a weak state, uh, because they feel overwhelmed, uh, it's almost like that, that might as well attitude. Uh, well, you know, nothing's going to go right in my life anyways. I, Yes, I might as well find some happiness where I can, so I'm going to go ahead and have this affair. Uh, whereas if things were going well and they had something that they thought they were living for, and uh, they, would, they would be tougher and say no to that kind of temptation. Uh, and so the idea of staying committed to your values, even when you're weak, uh, because weakness comes. Uh, <clears throat> to be resilient, you have to find meaning and purpose even during the storm. Uh, there were studies done, uh, some of you are familiar with the name Viktor Frankl, coming out of World War II and the, uh, the concentration camps, and studies were done about how some people survived and some people didn't. And, uh, and one of the things they said that they realized about the survivors was that they had purpose and meaning even though they were prisoners. And they said the, the difference would be the kinds of prisoners that found ways, even though secretly, to, to help and encourage the other prisoners. Uh, they developed uh, uh, languages, uh, sometimes by, uh, I, I read that they, uh, they would use the, the heels of their sandals or their feet or their shoes uh, by dragging them a certain way, by scuffing them, by tapping them, they would communicate certain things to the other prisoners. Uh, there were others who used hand signals when they were walking past each other. They would very subtle, uh, just kind of like wave their hand in a certain way, and that would signal things to the other prisoners. Uh, and so they said that, you know, I'm going to be a positive influence. I'm going to I'm going to be proactive here, uh, and and find meaning in that. I'm going to have a purpose in my life, even though I'm in prison and can't do much. I'd like to do a lot more, but this is, I'm limited to doing this, but I can at least do this what I'm limited to. Others say, uh, you know, well, I can't really make much of a difference why I do anything. And those are the people that tend to fail. Uh, to have resilience, you need to, to find meaning and purpose even when you're going through the tough times. And then uh, the last one is to be resilient, you have to face and overcome your fear. Uh, now that is a big one, and so I want to elaborate uh, that uh, a little bit more than, uh, than the other things uh, and talk about it at somewhat depth, partly because uh, it is so important, and I shared this a couple of weeks ago, uh, Uh, what is the most common command in the Bible? Do not be afraid. Uh, and, and for dramatic effect, I like the old King James. Fear not. Fear not. <laughs> a 
love that. Fear not. That's the most common command in the Bible. It comes up over and over and over again. And I don't know if God planned it that way or if it's an awesome coincidence. I lean toward planning. Um, it appears 366 times. You know, that's one for every day of the year, even in leap years. 365 days, leap year 366. Fear not shows up 366 times in the Bible. So that's one for every day of the year. Um, so, well, Pastor, you told us this a couple weeks ago. Well, that's not 366 times, is it? <laughs> I said it a couple weeks ago. Today makes twice. Uh, fear not, most common command in the Bible. And I want to remind you, as we think about why this is so important, why it applies to us, is I want you to remember that water walking represents doing with God's help what we could never do on our own. So, you know, when we talk about water working, water, water walking, uh, we're talking about um, as a metaphor. Uh, we don't mean we're all going to go out on a boat next week and, and walk on the water. Uh, we're talking about any time that, that God's having you do something or you feel called to do something or feeling that God is urging you to do something that you know you couldn't do without his help. If you can do it without his help, it's not walking on the water. Um, you know, if... Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and I think I asked a question a week or two ago. Uh, what are you doing uh, right now that you couldn't do without God's help? If you can't think of anything, then you're under-challenged. You know, are you saying that? Uh, what are you doing that you couldn't do without God's help? Uh, <clears throat> I also want to point out, uh, because some of us are mistaken about this, that God's promise to us is not to spare us from emotional discomfort. Uh, when you look at all of God's promises to us, that's not one of them. He doesn't say, and if you follow me, you'll never be discouraged. If you follow me, you'll never have pain. And Sharon alluded to this earlier, that I in prayers that, you know, they want God to be with Louie and give him strength during this time. Uh, <laughs> instead of just taking everything away from him. God never promised to take all of our problems and troubles away he promised to help us through them, and that's an important thing to do. And then uh, another related fact that we need to understand is that uh, research has been done, and the people who uh, know such things tell us that fear is the number one reason we avoid doing what God asks. So of all the reasons to say no to God, fear is number one. Uh, we start asking those what-if questions. I want you to do this. Well, what if this goes wrong? What if that happens? What if I make a fool of myself? Uh, what if I uh, try to reach this person and they reject me? Uh, what if they belittle me? What if, what if, what if, what if, I'm afraid of things not going the way I want them to go. Uh, that idea of fear is what stops us from doing what God asks. Uh, but I want to share with you um, from... Um, from our book. Uh, the idea of things we have to lose if we let fear dictate us. If we, if we succumb to fear, uh, we have some losses. Uh, first of all, what have you got to lose if you let fear stop you? Self-esteem. Uh, in fact, uh, again, uh, it has been said that uh, surprisingly, that is one of the number one uh, things that you lose if you let fear stop you. And here's how it works. Uh, when Peter stepped out of the boat and, and he's walking and he's thinking, this is awesome, I'm doing it, you know, I, I made it, I succeeded, I tried this and it worked. Um, that builds your self-esteem. And if Peter had said, you know, tell me to come out of the boat and walk on water to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter said, well, you know, on second thought, that looks kind of scary, not going to do it. For the 
rest of his life, he would have regretted not doing it. And every time he felt good about himself, the tempter, whatever, would have been there. Yeah, but what about that time you didn't walk on the water when you were supposed to? What about that time you said no? And he would begin to think of himself as a loser. And, and he would begin to not think well of himself. And he would feel bad about not being brave and all of this. Uh, succumbing to fear damages your self-esteem. Uh, it makes you feel bad about yourself. And so you don't want to succumb to fear. The second thing that, uh, that you lose if you let fear stop you is potential. Have you ever met someone? Uh, and, and I don't know the full story, uh, but I have with other friends, speculated over the years. Um, I went to high school uh, with a guy that was uh, like the number two recruited basketball player, high school basketball player in the state. And the other one was Magic Johnson. So at that time period, when Magic Johnson was being recruited and wound up being a superstar college basketball player, the guy from my high school was heavily recruited and wanted by everybody. He set all kinds of school records. Uh, and he was a multi-sport athlete. Uh, he has a bunch of records to this day uh, in track and field. Uh, to this day, he holds some of those basketball records, you know, points in the game, most points over a season, uh, rebounds, assists. Uh, when you get the most assists and the most points, that tells you something. And, uh, and, all these, and then for his college career, it, there wasn't one. Uh, he never lived up to his potential. And I've always felt that when it come time to pick a college and make the next step, uh, that he just kind of chickened out. Uh, he, he kind of feared the limelight and didn't want to get into this and the pressure was too high. And, uh, I, I think he was literally afraid to, to succeed. Uh, and that stopped him. So uh, he had the potential to be an NBA basketball star. But, but never reach that. And you probably know someone who could be the, uh, you know, the greatest uh, restaurant owner that, that you know, but he was afraid to buy a restaurant and start one. Or he was afraid to, uh, you might know someone that, that could have been great at something, but they never did it. Oh, he would have been a great artist, but you know, he would never let anyone look at his art. He could have been a great writer, but he would never let anyone read one of his stories. And, and, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, you, you never reach your full potential if you let fear stop you from trying things. You've got to, you've got to, you know, my uncle used to say about deer hunting, that there's, there's no lead flying, there's no deer dying. <laughs> if you're afraid to take a shot, you're not going to get one. You know, you, you've got to overcome that fear to shoot. Um, <clears throat> uh, potential. The next one is joy. Uh, and again, uh, kind of like uh, self-esteem, joy works the same way. Uh, you could do something that brings you great joy, and if you don't do it, uh, it brings sadness. Instead of being uh, happy about what you accomplished or what you did or what you even attempted to do, uh, instead you feel depressed and you're down because you didn't do it and you're discouraged. And, uh, you, you let it, uh, you let the fear uh, rob your joy. Uh, a little bit less clear is authentic intimacy. Authentic intimacy. If you uh, are afraid to, to be intimate, uh, you, you lose that. It doesn't come. And uh, I think one of the ways we illustrate this is, you ever played the quiet game when you were a kid? You ever try to get your kids to play the quiet game? <laughs> I remember being in the back seat with my sister on long trips, and uh, after a little while my mom, did, my mom or my dad would say, let's play a game. Let's see who of you can be quiet for the longest. <laughs> and so me and my sister would, I'm not going to talk, you know. And we would see how long we could go, and one of us would eventually win. Um, but I think when we grow up, we play it in a different way. You're in a meeting, and, and a couple other people, or you're not even in a meeting, like, you know, just an informal gathering, and two or three people say something, 
and you think that's not right, I should say something. Oh, but they might get mad at me if I do, they might not like me if I do, uh, you know, it might come off wrong, uh, I'm going to keep quiet. I'm not going to say anything. Or there's the people who have physical ailments and someone says, how are you? Fine. <laughs> I don't want to burden them with my problems. I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. I don't want to, you know. So I'm just going to keep quiet about my, my, my medical issues. Uh, or maybe it's other kinds of issues. Financial, physical, mental, emotional. Um, we would rather just keep quiet and not let anyone know. Um, and that prevents authentic intimacy. You can't really be close to someone if you keep a bunch of secrets from them and aren't open with them. Uh, and so succumbing to fear can prevent that authentic intimacy. And then availability to God. Uh, you know, if you're afraid to do things, um, then you're not going to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. If he's telling you to do one thing or another, you say, oh, I'm afraid to do that, I'm not going to do it. Uh, uh, fear robs that from you. And so, and we put those all together. Uh, and think about it. Uh, it's just too big a price to pay. Uh, losing all those things uh, is just not worth it. Uh, even that which you're afraid of is not as bad as losing all of those things. And so you have to get over that fear. One of the things that can help us get over that fear is by another important truth. Uh, and that revolves around God's character. God doesn't call to watch you sink. Jesus wasn't out on the lake. Peter said, have me come to you. Jesus didn't say, this would be fun. <laughs> I'm going to call Peter out here. He'll take about three steps and start thinking, hilarious. So that's not how God works. Uh, if he calls you to do something, he is going to enable you to do it. And, and the things that do come after that that don't go right, the things that do go wrong, uh, he will be with you through it. And he will help you through it and help you get over it. Um, he doesn't do these things just to watch you sink. So to wrap up this series, it's time to get out of the boat. It's time for all of us to take that first step, get out of the boat, and, uh, and do those things that God is calling us to do, and here comes the important part, that you couldn't do without God's help. If you can do it without God's help, that's not stepping out of the boat. That's not, that doesn't require faith even. Um, you know, oh, I could do that. Uh, so that's my challenge to you that's our challenge to Kenosha Family Church as a group and it's uh, my challenge to you as an individual uh, it's time to get out of the boat it's time to start taking steps of faith uh, that you know without God's help it won't work uh, that's when you're really doing things for him the things that, that that's, that's why he gives gifts and, and, and helps people and do all these things. Um, it just occurs to me, even as I was saying that, that if you go through the Old Testament, time and time again, uh, you know, God would raise up someone to do something, and it says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and, and they were suddenly able to do this stuff. And that could be everyone from, uh, you know, people like Moses leading the people out of Egypt, uh, to some goldsmith who suddenly is better at it as he starts making uh, instruments for the temple. And the Holy Spirit came on him, and then suddenly he could do all this goldsmithing stuff that he couldn't do before as well. Um, it's time to get out of the boat. Let's pray.